Hi, hello, welcome back to Body Based Therapy. My name is Dev Raj. And this week I wanted to do a book review of Wilhelm Reich's The Mass Psychology of Fascism. Quite a title for a book, hey? You know, I mean, it's like an attractive title if you're any kind of, you know, underground or rebellious kind of character. The Mass Psychology of Fascism. The book also became notorious because, uh, well, the Americans burned it. Well, they burned all of his books. So, you know, they didn't specifically burn this one. They burned a load of his books uh, in the wake of a court case in the 50s by the FDA. And I'm fairly sure the Nazis definitely burned it. And then the Russian communists also banned it. So, you know, it's like one of the few books that's ever been either burned or banned by the, by the communists, by the Nazis and by the Americans. So on that level alone, you know, it, it, it has acquired a certain prestige in the mind of the more rebellious individual in the, in the Western world. The book was essentially, I went through several editions, and I think the final one was in 1946, which is what I read. But it was initially written, I think, in the early 30s, and Reich had become intrigued by a certain question. And the question was, why did Germany, you know, suffering reparations, and you know all the loss of face from World War One, which it of course lost. You know why did it not swing towards communism, where Russia had already gone, and instead swing towards Nazism politically? Because what Reich and a lot of other commentators on on, on European politics noticed in the early 30s, around 1933 was that the Nazi party had come from virtually nothing, virtually nothing around 1928 to be the dominant party by 1933. And of course, in those days, Russian communism was still young. The revolution happened around 1917. And I think Lenin and the Politburo came to power around 1919. So really, we're just talking about a decade and a decade, even though I think Lenin died around 24 and Stalin kind of slowly eliminated other members of the, the Politburo, uh, Trotsky fled the country, blah, blah, blah. Nevertheless, Europe was still kind of, for the intellectuals of Europe and people who were kind of a little bit countercultural or whatever, you know, Russian communism was still a very, very exciting new idea at that time. And it represented like, you know, the, the, a possibility to change from, from the standard kind of, you know, feudal influenced capitalism that was emerging in Europe at that time. It stood as a major alternative. So the question for Reich was, in this five-year period when the Nazi party rose to dominance, why did that happen and why didn't the people go towards communism, which there were also communist parties in Germany at that time? The book is about 250 pages long and I struggled with it. You know, it took me about six weeks. I kind of started, like, my, my, my plan was to do, like, 15 pages a day and I didn't really keep that up, you know, work weekdays. I didn't really keep that up. I really, I really struggled with it. Some bits I kind of engaged with, particularly towards the end, but a lot of it I really, really struggled with. Partly because I'm, I'm not so interested in Marxism, and I think a lot of the Marxist theories that Reich was at times commentating on, you know, have, have subsequently anyway kind of collapsed from view. They're not really even looked at by hardly anyone, bar a few academics somewhere, anywhere these days. Of course, not Reich's fault. Uh, this was written, you know, like 70, 80 years ago. And, you know, I read a translated edition, I don't speak German, it was originally in German, uh, by a guy called um, Theodor Wolf, who I think was a, a um, possibly a protege or fan or associate of Wilhelm Reich in America. And I'm sure he did a good translation, it's just that the subject material and the style I don't find so easy to read. And I had a feeling that there's a lot of repetition, a lot of reinforcement of various concepts and this kind of thing. It's, it's like other bits of Reich, which I've, I've tried to read, you know, it is written on a very academic level. It's not, it's not meant for the average reader. So having said all of this, you know, what, 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 how would I sum up the mass psychology of fascism? Because Reich does, in there, in all of that verbiage and, and, and discussion about old concepts and political systems which have kind of disappeared, he does come up with several very, very interesting points. I think one of the biggest points Reich makes is not to blame Hitler, because certainly, you know, if, if I look now with my brain from 2022, and I was born in the 60s and stuff, my whole impression of how Hitler came to power was it was Hitler's fault, mostly. You know, he was just some evil dictator who found his way to the top and got all these kind of poor, impoverished Germans from like World War One, you know, who'd had all these reparations enacted upon them by the West, and they all just kind of followed him, and it was mostly Hitler's fault. And Reich certainly doesn't go down that line at all. 
He does look, and we'll have a look in a minute, his reasoning as to how Hitler became so powerful, but he doesn't really blame Hitler. You know, he seems to take more the opinion, which is one I'd agree with, you know, that there are bad people everywhere. You know, there are there are people who are quite malign everywhere who get into power for wrong reasons and stuff like that. But hopefully in a society, the structure is such that they don't ever acquire, you know, the level of power that Hitler acquired. So instead of blaming Hitler, Reich essentially puts the onus on the masses, on the German people themselves. But they themselves, as a mass, were really not capable of choosing another option, of choosing a better option for themselves. And then Reich also examines the reasons for that. And the primary reason that Reich comes up with really is, the, is to do with the, what he called the German nuclear family. The basic German family, he says, is so sexually repressive that all that repressed sexual energy at some point got channeled by Hitler and the Nazi party into a lot of kind of, you know, visionary, uh, heavy German symbolism up in the mind. So Hitler, by drawing on all this old spiritual symbolism, basically created a channel for all the repressed sexual energy inside the average German to be brought up into their mind, where they could then be inspired to follow him. So, of course, you can see Hitler giving these huge speeches and rallies if you go on, you know, on, on, on YouTube and look to videos of the time. And there's all sorts of regalia behind him. And he's, he's you know, he's, he's just creating this mass vision. And there's just thousands of people watching him. And they're just all this energy, this sec repressed sexual energy, right, is, is being channeled right up their body. A little bit similar to the way that the aggressive personality type does, you know, in Reichian character structure. And then they're all getting totally into this, and then over the course of five years from 1928 to 1933, you know, the party attracted millions and millions of Germans and just started to really build from there. Before anyone had really noticed from the outside, it had already taken off so powerfully that nothing could really stop it. And and so the Nazi party were pretty much unstoppable at that point, and war was at some point inevitable. So these are the two basic points that Reich makes in the book, the two fundamental points. He elaborates on them a bit and also talks about, you know, the way forwards and uh, some other uh, times later on also about, you know, why he's motivated to work and what his underlying attitude is. One of the points Reich makes is that it's not really possible for the masses to move in a positive direction for themselves whilst they still live in this kind of very oppressive family structure. Because the, sexual, the natural sexuality of adolescent men and women is so suppressed, it makes them easy to control. They're afraid to really come out of themselves. Whilst this might work for certain you know, authoritarian but not necessarily fascistic regimes of government, the danger is that that level of sexual repression in a large number of people can then kind of spill over into them following a fascist leader. And what I find interesting about that is that whilst there's not much evidence that, you know, major Western political leaders or academics, you know, really took on board Reich's work, it was pretty countercultural underground, you know, nevertheless, post-war Europe and post-war America, post-war Western society became more sexually liberal. And that may have been partly by some understanding in the culture or perhaps more likely by the kind of flower power era and the, and the 1960s revolution. So that's one thing that Reich notes, that the excessive repression of our natural sexuality in adolescence is potentially a very dangerous thing, social force. Another aspect that Reich goes into is character structure, not extensively. He doesn't really look at the character structure of Hitler himself or later on of the various uh, Russian leaders such as Stalin, or indeed even at the kind of masses, apart from noting their general rigidity. But because he does look back at communism and where it seemed to go wrong, certainly by the 1940s edition of his book, he concludes that it's not really possible to create this kind of dictatorship of a proletariat or whatever Lenin's phrase was, you know, this, this society in which people naturally develop and create just a better and better society, unless character structure is addressed. Unless there's some way that people can break free from the very early traumas that they go through in the average family. So for me, I would say this is Reich's central thesis, and it's really tied together with the sexuality as well. But if it's ever going to be possible for something like a Russian revolution or socialism or communism to work, he's saying it must have these two aspects. You must find a way to break through childhood trauma. So people aren't just living out their lives in this kind of pre-egoic control that's being exerted from their frontal lobes. 
and secondarily that when they start to hit puberty and become sexually active you know you can't just suppress all of that you have to allow people to explore themselves sexually because that's part of how they really grow and develop and these for me really are, are the main points that Reich makes in this book Something I also found interesting much later on in the book, in fact, not quite at the end, but just kind of in the last chapter somewhere, Reich spoke a little bit about why he took, you know, such a kind of uncompromising stance in his work, because he'd already become famous uh, as, a, as a student of Freud back in Austria, and character analysis in his psychological work could easily have sustained him throughout his life. He would have had status, wouldn't have gone to prison, he likely wouldn't have died then, you know, and he, and he could have possibly integrated body-based therapy into psychotherapy to a much greater degree than, 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 than actually happened, i.e. pretty much not at all. But Reich insists in this book that it's necessary to keep exploring because I think he even says somewhere, you know, it might take another 10 or 20 world wars before humanity is really ready for this message, but it's really ready to create a structure which will liberate the masses. Remember, Reich doesn't put the emphasis on leadership. You know, the leaders will do their thing. He says you've got to bring the masses to a place where they can start to create their own revolution, which will be ongoing within humanity. And he believed that it was necessary for him at his time to simply keep researching or going to simply keep doing his work, whatever, to not compromise with it because the record that it left might not be valuable even for like another 1,000, 10,000 years. Who knows? But at that point, it might be valuable. So I found that interesting. You know, I also sometimes wonder, really, looking at the world, whether we are, you know, before some kind of major cataclysm or apocalyptic event occurs, actually going to create a healthy society. It doesn't look all that likely to me, but of course you never know. Even in my own books, a lot of what's motivated me is a, is, a, is a kind of desire to preserve things for the future, so the future generations can pick this stuff up, assuming that books and written material make it through any number of world wars, apocalypses, or whatever humanity has to go through before it can come to a place where it can really step up. Okay, so that's my review of Reich's The Mass Psychology of Fascism. I hope you found it interesting. Do feel free to leave a comment, and I'll be doing another book review soon.